Blue Eye Samurai, a brand new Netflix original anime, which is not one of the greatest animes in the modern day, but it is also just an absolute amazing story in general, even outside of just being an anime. This series has just hit all the high bars and all the high notes, and honestly, it's really just been a pleasure being in this world. Hello everybody, and welcome to All Things Watched. In this video, we are going to talk about episode 6 of Blue Eye Samurai, which was titled, All Evil Dreams and Angry words so we're just going to go right ahead and jump into the review and the breakdown of the episode and i would like to apologize real quick if i sound a little silly i do have a little touch of a head call don't worry it's nothing serious but it is going to alter my voice a little bit and make me sound a little silly uh, i work in a public domain and uh in this area in the place that i work we also sell medicines and stuff for people to get better so oftentimes i'm dealing with not only the public but also dealing with sick public so <laughs> you know it's not uncommon for me to catch a cold or a uh, little head cold but anyways let's just go right ahead and jump in to the review so this episode opens with an absolute awesome uh, montage, uh, uh, so to speak. Well, not even a montage, actually. It just opens with a really good rock and roll song, which is a song known, I think it was from uh, Whom the, the Bell, Something with the Bells, which originally was a Metallica song, I believe. But I think in this series they did the remake, and I don't think it was actually Metallica. Uh, For Whom the, the Bells Ring Toll, or some I can't remember exactly, what, but I know the song, and I know it's a Metallica song, and we have Mitsu here now, and Mitsu is looking up at the castle, and she is just getting ready to go in, and hopefully just cause total chaos, you know, we, the, you know, the whole series has been leading up to this moment, we've been wanting Mitsu to really just go in here and find this white devil, and just, you know, annihilate him, basically, uh, and so, uh, but before she goes in there, what I did appreciate was that she actually sits down and says a little prayer, and I thought that, that the reason why I appreciated that is because, you know, that sort of spiritual, cultural uh, characteristic is very uh, prominent in the samurai way you know they're very strict to their culture how they act how they you know the stuff that they eat how they train you know meditation is very important and so we end up getting this flashback then while she's meditating she we actually see the flashbacks you know we see her as a little girl we see her mom and her mother being attacked uh, and whatnot we see uh you know we see um we, we see ringo you hear stuff uh, you know, she's sort of remembering back on stuff that happened recently, you know, stuff with Tygen and Ringo and all that cool stuff, and so it was really cool to see this flashback, uh, you know, during this time of meditation, and so something, once again, you know, I can really appreciate, uh, you know, the writing and the editing of all of these episodes, and quite frankly, I think that, uh, this was one of the better edited uh, episodes as well, and actually this uh, is my favorite episode so far, And, uh, and uh, but we'll get into that later. And so when she's finished her meditating, and all these flashbacks sort of go away, then she comes back and she starts looking at the map uh, that she has and whatnot, which I think is really kind of like a floor plan, so it's more like a diagram, um, like a, a, a level diagram, I think they call them. Uh, there is a real name on it, I can't quite remember, or, or like almost like a topograph, and she is looking at the, the plans, and she's basically studying to try her best to get the, you know, the layout of the land as to where she's about to go. <clears throat> Excuse me, I apologize, that's the head call I was talking about, so... Um, so she ends up finding the secret passage in, and it's really like this huge, massive gate. It looks very heavy, but it does open inward. It's an in-swing gate, uh, which I actually thought was kind of interesting, because, you know, I was thinking that maybe they would use this passage... Uh, I mean, the villains, like the bad guys, so to speak. I, I I always kind of figured that this would be almost like an emergency hatch or like an emergency exit, you know, if, if, if the people inside the castle had to get out. And I just thought it was peculiar that it was an in-swing, because I just feel like, um, well, for one, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not very good for defense. It's a lot harder to open something by pulling it up than to let it in. But then on top of that, I was thinking, well, what if there was a lot of snow, and it was a big blizzard or something, and then they open it, you know, like all the snow would fall in. Uh, you know, just little details like that, but... 
either way, <laughs> Mitsu finds it and opens it up, and she ends up going into uh, the tunnel, and she, she, while she's going through this tunnel, she sees all sorts of bones and crazy stuff, which looks like, you know, bones from people of all ages, adults, and even, of course, really young children, maybe even babies, and she ends up coming to this door, and this is sort of the first big obstacle that she faces. It's not so much that the door itself is the obstacle. Uh, Mitsu is really good at this stuff. She knows how to pick a lock. She can really work her way around, uh, you know, a locked door. But the problem is, is that this appears to be uh, some some form of uh, like drainage system or something. And so you can tell that this is absolutely the first line of defense. You, if you can remember. Um, you know, uh, before she infiltrated this building in a previous episode, I believe it was actually episode three, uh, when she went and met the gentleman with Tigan, her and Tigan went and met the gentleman and they sat down and had green tea, they had matcha and, uh, you know, and he told them about the 500 arrows. If you can remember that Ringo ends up saving them. Well, he told Mitsu in that conversation that this place was going to be very heavily guarded and is going to have major defenses. And so while Mitsu here is trying to unlock the door, the whole drain sort of, uh, the drain storm tunnel is almost what I'm calling it, almost like a sewage tunnel or like a drain storm tunnel, ends up releasing all the water and it actually ends up making her almost drown. Now she is able to regain her composure and, uh, and her, uh, and sort of, you know, stay calm. And she's able to unlock the door and get through and she manages to escape barely she barely escapes but she does she manages to escape and get into uh inside of the the building or inside of the fortress and you know so even though this might seem like it's a very small detail in the story this actually says a lot about Mitsu because one it says that Mitsu knows how to swim uh you know which is what not always necessarily a common thing uh for people back during the 17th century uh you know I would think that most samurais could swim just because I would think that they would want to be prepared for you know everything including something like this you know obviously Mitsu would not have survived this if she couldn't swim uh so I, I think that that was a you know just a small detail which once again shows the level of talent and skill that she has and so I really appreciated that little part of it you know seeing the fact that she was a she was able to swim and that she was able to escape now once again even though she makes it into this fortress she is very much winded you know this, this really took a lot of energy it took a lot of good out of her uh, not to the point where obviously she's disabled or not able to continue uh, but it definitely you know put some wear and tear on her body she's also very wet now which probably means she's very cold and that kind of stuff and so she ends up uh, making it to the next level here and as you can see <coughs> We get a really cool sequence here where she is actually uh, going through this level of the fortress and there's and it's very heavily guarded so this is sort of now like the next line of defense all throughout the temple or this fortress there's many many guards all over the place and so she has to really work her way through here and be very stealthy and i really liked how stealthy that she was but remember she's actually uh very soaking wet and one of the guards actually ends up seeing uh the puddles or the water trail that i guess causes stripping off of mitsu and so she sort of has to kick into overdrive and take these uh you know these guards out very quickly which she is able to do and it was a really cool sequence seeing her you know be stealthy but then also be very aggressive and very assertive if she needs to and she does a really good job at uh you know disarm uh, actually you know killing the guards but then when she kills uh the guard up on the top the blood his blood ends up going underneath the door in which another guard sees it and then he starts to ring a bell but mitsu was on top of him very quickly and he she you know cut, kills him but first she cuts off his arm so he can no longer ring the bell and and all that stuff so i don't think that there was any necessarily any you know heavy damage done here in the sense of you know alerting uh, or sounding the alarm I'm, I'm pretty sure she was able to neutralize that threat even though the, the guard was able to ring the bell two or three times I don't think it was enough to really ex actually fully expose her now in the meantime 
when we come upstairs now, now we have the uh, the the you know sort of the we'll call the villainous alliance. Uh, everybody that's working with uh, this main villain here, uh, the White Devil, who I think they say his name is Fowler, and uh, I could be a little bit wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure they said his name is Fowler. And so he's having a meeting here, and he's you know, and they're basically discussing all their plans. And it seems as though the plan is uh, that they are, you know, going to start importing a bunch of his guns. You know, he comes from the British, so, you know, they're going to start, he's going to start bringing uh, the guns into Japan. And basically, I, I guess, to have sort of a territorial takeover, he's probably going to take over certain cities, certain clans, certain villages, uh, or at least the Japanese will, and he's just going to profit off it. You know, so basically, it's kind of like a supply and demand, uh, very much like a manufacturing business. You know, he provides the weapons and they pay him and also keep him safe and give him security and and all that stuff and he gets to live a very large a very grand life and whatnot and of course during this meeting uh, I get uh, you know as Mitsu continues to go up through the castle and whatnot uh, then they discover and learn that Mitsu is actually finally here and as you can see uh, this uh, gentleman that was in that third episode who told Mitsu basically all about the castle and where Fowler was and where the white devil was and where he was hiding <clears throat> as you can see now he's very concerned and he actually tells Fowler, you know, he basically says, hey, I told you this was going to happen. This is not your everyday samurai. This is not just someone that you can just, you know, sort of, you know, just get rid of. This is a very highly decorative trained samurai with a lot of skill and talent, but also someone who has a lot of motivation, a lot of ambition. Sorry, folks, I had to have a drink there for a second. And <clears throat> so he is very concerned and he basically sort of stands up to Fowler and tells him, hey, you should be concerned too, because this is not someone who you can just, you know, <laughs> just make go away. And so he tells Fowler that he actually wants to look and watch her uh, process and watch at, you know, her, you know, sort of making her way up through the fortress. And he basically wants to keep an eye on her and see how well she's going to do, <clears throat> you know, and see if she's going to be able to get through all these defenses and then we see him actually looking through this sort of like this peak hole type thing but it has a bunch of mirrors so he's able to see uh you know at different levels like guess at different uh locations and i, I really like that and i was very curious if is you know if, if that's actually a real thing were they actually able to really do something like that in the 17th century you know did samurais or you know these <clears throat> people of high authority in the Japanese culture, did they really have these types of things set up? Uh, I never actually researched it or Googled it, so I, I don't really know. Uh, but I would be curious to to know if that form of technology really existed. And I, I, I can't see why it wouldn't. Like I said, it's only a bunch of mirrors being positioned in a certain way. So I just thought it was really cool that they that they showed that. So in the meantime, Mitsu continues to uh, make her way through the castle. And as you can see, everything is booby-trapped, almost like if you're playing a video game, especially something like a Tomb Raider video game or like an Indiana Jones type thing. Um, you know, she's having to use her skills and her talents to try to manipulate her way through all these traps. But uh, And she pretty well gets through uh, all these traps here in this tunnel, except at the very end when she basically... Basically, make does one final move to try and dive through the tunnel to escape. Her foot ends up getting impaled with this metal uh, spear or metal shank, whatever you want to call it, this metal bar, and of course it ends up catching her. And so this once again now causes uh, Mitsu to be at a very, very, very big disadvantage now. For if she is able to find Fowler, she's now very damaged. So even if she can get through all the booby traps and whatnot, remember she's already been, you know, soaked in water, and now she's just been stabbed right through the foot. And so, you know, she's already beaten and battered and also probably very tired. Uh, you know, so you can see how these traps are not only designed to injure her, but also designed to wear her out, to make her deplete as much energy as possible before she even gets up to the main villain or to uh, Fowler. 
And so she ends up uh, getting past all those traps anyways, but then she has no choice but to take the steel out of her foot because, of course, you know, she can't just leave it there, obviously, because it could be infected. It could get infected and whatnot, so she pulls the shank out of her foot, which causes her then, of course, a lot of agony and a lot of pain, but also now it causes her to be somewhat crippled. You know, she is a little bit, you know, she can't just walk on her foot now, so she's probably lost a little bit of... Uh, strength and stuff so you know just very uh, very hard to watch Mitsu go through all this uh, you know especially uh, considering because we know you know this is not the finale this is only episode six so you know I, I, I find it very hard to think that you know she's going to kill because we know that there's four four of these people in total and right now she's only hunting the second one so it's very unlikely that all four are going to be handled in this season unless it ends like in the finale and two of them are together or something like that you know maybe the other two are working together like side by side but either way like i i, I feel like they've built so much towards this character fowler the person that she's hunting now i almost feel like maybe he's going to be just the main finale the boss at the end of this one uh, but who knows, we'll have to wait and see. But either way, she pulls it out and then uh, pulls the metal shank out of her foot and then she carries on. So she k keeps going now. Now she's outside and she's sort of in this... Uh, once it's still, and remember, the path forward in order for her to get into this fortress, uh, into the part where uh, the White Devil is or where Fowler is, you know, it's almost like it's, it's, it's only one linear path. There's not really too many options that she has there's not like she can just you know go a different way she's kind of forced to go through all these booby traps because that's just the way that the castle was designed you know like the guy was telling her back in uh episode three he told her that it, you know even just reaching fowler was going to be very difficult <clears throat> excuse me and so she ends up getting uh, to this location where there ends up being a trap door and so you know, it's it's really wide, but she still has enough confidence in her own skill that she can just jump over this and potentially actually make it. And also, it's worth noting that she's still uh, using the weapon that she had uh, put together. You know, she's not using it just as a samurai sword. She's using it as sort of like the spear samurai sword type thing. Uh, I, I can't remember the actual name. Was it like a katana, so to speak, or something? And so she runs and jumps. And But this time, when she's already in the air and she jumps, then the second part of the doors open making that space twice you know double the amount of space so she's obviously not going to make that jump and so uh you know mitsu is smart enough and calm enough to be able to figure this out and so she uses her sword and she basically shoves it into the wall or into the cracks and crevices of the wall and she basically ends up using it uh as a, you know as something that she can sort of swing off and then of course she ends up landing perfectly on the other side but when she gets over there, then she is met by basically a small army of guards. So once again, now she has to uh, fight her way out and try to survive, even though she just went through all those challenges and all that, you know, all those booby traps and, and made it this far. And now she has to fight all these people. Now, I will give credit when credit is due. And I do think that this was probably the best fight sequence uh one of the best fighting sequences probably that we've ever seen in any show not just anime but i think that this was one of the best coolest sequences uh, at least that i've seen in quite some time uh, because of everything you know the, the the sound the the score the music and then also even the way that this was filmed the camera work that they did during this uh battle and during this fighting sequence was very unique and i really really liked it and to me, this was the best episode so far, uh, by far, in terms of action sequence, and we haven't seen anything in the series yet that was as good as this, and uh, like I said, when you think about everything, not just the fact that she's fighting, but also the sound, and the choreography, the camera angles, the way it was directed, the way the animation looked, and so, you know, this is by far, you know, like, if, if they did this good of a job here in episode 6, like, I can't imagine what episode 8 is going to be like, the finale, uh, like, what, what type of fighting sequences we might end up getting there. But either way, this was just mind-blowing. Uh, I actually watched this sequence multiple times. I didn't just watch it and then keep going. I actually went back and rewatched it a couple times because I thought it was just done so well, uh, you know, with everything. And so, 
she continues and then of course she ends up getting to the next sort of booby trap or uh, you know the next thing to slow her down or to uh, sort of uh, disarm her so they've already sort of you know depleted her energy in terms of physical energy they've already depleted uh, they've already injured her you know by that impaling her foot and then they made her fight a group of guards but now here here they're going to try and weaken her mentally here they're going to try and weaken her mind because what they have is they have this poisonous power or this poisonous flower sorry that has the power to make you basically delusional and psychic it's almost like a psychedelic drug type thing and so this little monkey has it and I guess the monkey is uh, sort of a way to try and deceive her to make her think that you know there's no harm from this cute little monkey and so uh, the monkey ends up holding up the flower to her but then the monkey actually blows the flower and it causes this poisonous uh, I guess the pollen of the flower is poisonous and she breathes it all in causing her to hallucinate and here we end up getting some really cool graphics and really cool uh, designs and really cool uh, you know like almost like it's a monster type movie uh, which we actually did see in the pre earlier in the series when she was training and she was just fighting sort of like her imagination but as you can see her eyes are glowing really blue and it was really cool and then uh, I really like I just really enjoyed uh, that whole sequence and the animation was beautiful that's why I didn't put any screenshots of it here it's something that I think is just better for you to go and watch and actually experience rather than me you know sort of showing you every single scene in every sequence I think this one in particular when she's hallucinating uh, is a scene that is worth just watching just go and watch it and see it for yourself uh, I don't want to take that away here uh, I don't want to insult the animation by just taking a screenshot and so after she gains some sort of uh, composure she's still you know very heavily medicated and still very loopy so to speak she makes her way to the dungeons and when she's in the dungeons she finally reunites and finds Tygen and I was really really happy about uh, about this that now they finally reunited and she sees how badly beaten uh, that Tygen is and actually even up to this point even Mitsu herself now is very badly beaten and worn and depleted and and you know my mind was just racing watching this scene because I was thinking you know how are they going to escape because both of them are so badly beaten that I don't even I don't think that even two of them put together now will be strong enough to be able to take on uh, Fowler because just because like he's surrounded by other Japanese people as well and I feel like <clears throat> excuse me if even one of those people were as skilled and as talented as Mitsu was like I just don't see or even as talented as Tygen is I just don't see how either one of them will be strong enough to get through it so I was, I was starting to get a little worried here that maybe they would get captured or worse yet maybe Tygen would actually end up being killed uh, you know because I really like Tygen and I don't want him to get killed he's very honorable uh, so it was really nice also it's worth mentioning once again I didn't take any screenshots because I didn't want to ruin the animation for you uh, but they do have a really cool fighting sequence here where she's fighting people and they look like uh, almost like vampires because she's still hallucinating which then takes us to uh, the next scene here when she then now has to fight off against this uh, what they called the giant and remember this was the same guy that gave her and Tygen the invitation to go and have green tea with the gentleman in the previous episodes when the guy told her where Fowler was located and how heavily guarded the fortress was and all that stuff and so she now ends up having to fight this demon or this giant who looks like a demon because remember she's still hallucinating so I really love the visuals and it was just so cool and it was a really fun battle too and she had to really get creative with this one there was a couple of parts about this animation that was or about this sequence that I thought was a little unrealistic and I know what you're probably thinking obviously it's unrealistic it's a it's an anime it's not real life but still you know there is one scene when Mitsu stabs him through the neck and he's still able to survive that and I was just like uh, I don't know about that one even within this world that they created it's still a pretty grounded show you know all these visuals is only because she's hallucinating they're not actually demons it's still a very realistic show so uh, but anyways she gets creative and she ends up uh you know ends up overpowering him and killing him uh, but of course she's only able to do this by causing some serious collateral damage and as you can see here a beautiful scenery uh, you know of her uh, overcoming uh, that battle but then also she basically blows up this entire room because she's forced to use an explosion basically that's uh, sort of how she's able to get out of this battle uh, by sort of blowing up the entire room but once again you know this 
absolutely annihilates her and I'm, I'm sure Tigan probably got a little bit of a you know impact from the blast as well and so both her and Tigan now are pretty well I mean she's not as low as Tigan is obviously I mean she's still doing a lot better than him but she is very much getting to her low low point I don't know that we've ever seen Mitsu as low as this uh at least not yet anyways uh you know I, I don't think that we've ever seen her this badly beaten uh at least not yet but anyways uh, she's able to overcome that and this scene once again it was really pushing the boundaries of uh, you know realism uh, but you know I was able to put it aside because I love the story and I love the characters but here uh, their only way forward then is that Mitsu has to take Taigen literally on her back and carry him up over this wall but it was really cool it was very symbolic you know they just came from this room that had exploded and now they're climbing up the side of a, a wall and she's carrying Tigan, which is very symbolic you know it's kind of like the phoenix rising from the ashes you know literally rising she's climbing and so she keeps ascending and then finally she makes it right up and gets into the room she goes through the glass and this is now where uh fowler is and all the people all the japanese people working with fowler even though they don't really like fowler they do like what he has to offer they're really only there because of his resources they're not there because they like him in fact a couple of them are trying to you know get away from him and sort of get out of the partnership but a very funny sequence here how she goes in through the glass she literally just throws Tigan in through the glass which was really funny because he's not even able to defend himself or stop himself uh, she literally just throws him through the window so I, I literally laughed out loud when I seen that it was really funny and so uh, and, and whatnot and so she finally stands against Fowler and against the white devil and unfortunately you know he does what he does best he uh, just uh, remains a coward and he doesn't fight fairly and he pulls out the gun which is the whole reason why he's here remember he's uh, importing all these weapons so that certain clans over here in Japan certain families certain clans you know uh, so that you know with the different families and the different emblems essentially he's providing them with the weapons to be able to take over territory so that you know really highly trained decorative uh, so, uh, you know warriors like the samurai will basically no longer be a threat as we can see here Mitsu is taken out like almost instantly is not even like remotely close it's not even a, a fair challenge this guy is using a gun she's using a sword and it was really uh, you know it was really sad to see it but it was also very almost symbolic because when he shoots Mitsu he shoots at her and the bullet actually hits her sword and then ricochets into her shoulder <clears throat> which is actually a really good thing because if not it would have killed her uh, but it also ends up actually breaking that sword and remember that sword was made from that meteor which was supposed to be like a almost like an impenetrable rock it was a type of mineral that was supposed to be or at least what they thought indestructible but then it shatters and breaks to these weapons and to these guns which is very symbolic to Mitsu herself who was very shattered and broken because of this man and because of the other three white devils and what they've done to her and her family and so it was very symbolic you know as the sword breaks because he has the better weapon uh, she herself is also broken because of the dominance that he has over her mentally not just physically but mentally and so I thought it was really appropriate that they you know that they did that and uh and whatnot and and this here is actually the the screenshot of when he shoots uh the shoots and actually breaks the sword it's a really cool slow motion uh scene it was almost like it was a bullet time almost like something you would see in the matrix movie but all in all it just looked really good and the animation was great and i love that they sort of slowed down uh the the bullet and the gunshot and it was actually kind of hard to watch uh but anyways um uh while all this is happening, uh, uh, Tigan, of course, is still very much badly beaten. Um, he does sort of come to to try and help Mitsu, uh, but he's not quite able to. And so Mitsu is having all these flashbacks, which is very appropriate. They're both beaten and battered so much now that I would not be surprised that she's actually having sort of flashbacks in her life. Because she's probably sort of, you know, at the end of her life. She's probably literally dying right now. She's been impaled. She's been beaten. She's been battered. And now she's been shot. And so she's losing so much blood that I have no doubts in my mind that she's legitimately dying. 
but they do have a really good redemption arc here for Mitsu because remember uh, if you can remember to a previous episode I was saying how I didn't like for that one episode I didn't really believe the direction that they took Mitsu as a character well here they have a really good redemption they make her the same Mitsu that we knew for the whole series and they really make her likable again now and not to say that we didn't like her anyways but you know what I mean like they really give her a good redemption here in this episode uh, because she starts to think about Ringo and we start to hear things that Ringo is saying like Ringo there's like one little uh, quick little thing that she hears Ringo saying you know a, uh, an apprentice never strays too far away from his master and stuff like that and she really starts to come to terms with Ringo as a person and how valuable he is and how she this is almost like a uh, she's really starting to respect him to a whole new level now and uh, and she actually uh, sort of is able to regain her 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 stature and she gets up uh, kneeling on the sword and she basically says you know Ringo I will train you basically and saying now that she will actually officially accept him as an apprentice and in one final act of desperation because she knows that both her and Tigan will die if they don't get out of the situation she ends up uh, literally running and just uh, you know uh, diving at uh, Tigan, uh, causing both of them to go through the window and falling right from the top of this castle right down into a frozen lake and once again you know the the scenery here is absolutely beautiful the animation is absolutely beautiful the ice and the sort of the light coming down from the water once again very symbolic you have the light and the darkness you know you have Mitsu and Taigen who are fighting for good they come down through the light but now they're as they lose their life they're getting deeper into the water all very symbolic uh, but also very beautiful visually and then of course the very last scene here is all we see <clears throat> excuse me is a shadow of somebody uh, you know standing over the ice and they don't reveal right here in this episode who it is, but I think it's pretty obvious that this is Ringo. Uh, I mean, they don't really confirm it, but it looks like Ringo. You know, it has the same sort of shape as Ringo and, and whatnot. And so, uh, and, and that's basically where that episode uh, ends. It ends with uh, Ringo, or who we think is Ringo, uh, you know, looking over them. And it seems as though he's going to uh, save them and pick them up and, I you know, do what Ringo always does and... Uh, and yeah and help them and most likely bandage them up and all that kind of stuff and so and that's where the episode ends so all in all i really like the episode uh i'm not surprised that the episode went this way i'm not surprised that uh the white devil i think his name is fowler i'm not surprised that he survived um you know he's the uh second white devil now the first one was a part of the four fangs i think so <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that was the first one, the guy that was a part of the Four Fangs, and now this is the second one. So, at this point, if she was not able to overcome Fowler, uh, then I have no doubts in my mind that we're not going to see the other two in this season. That'll be in season two, and um, and yeah, so sh the finale, I would suspect, will be all about uh, her taking on Fowler, maybe like one final assault. Or maybe the other way around. Who knows? Maybe this time Fowler will come for her. It would be cool to see a little bit of a switch. It would be cool to see Fowler uh, get you know so involved with Mitsu that maybe he takes the first step as opposed to making her. You know, you know what I mean. Like rather than having her assault him, it would be cool if he came for her, and that would also uh, might maybe even keep her and Tigan off their game. But either way, I love the fact that her and Tigan are now reunited. I really like the fact that Tigan now is going to be saved and healed the same as Mitsu. Uh, I don't think either one of them are going to die in this season. At least not at this point. I thought maybe Tigan could end up dying. But if, if she was able to save him and Ringo gets to both of them, uh, which he did obviously, or we think it's Ringo, uh, then I have no doubts in my mind that Tigan is very likely not going to die at least not until the finale. Even then, I I, I just, I don't know. I, I feel like their relationship is still sort of building. I, I think that, you know, the, the Netflix is still sort of building their relationship. So I just don't see him dying in this season. I don't mean he won't die at all. Uh, I really don't see Ringo dying. Uh, but I could maybe see 
uh, a Kemi dying or someone like a Kemi maybe because I think that would be a great motivation for uh, Tigan to then stay with Mitsu if a Kemi goes away and, and leaves the pitcher and I think that Ringo will eventually be trained uh, for sure in season two I think he'll become more important and and I, and I mean in a physical way like I think he'll be on more physical journeys physical missions and that kind of stuff so very excited to see where it goes for the next two episodes but all in all I absolutely love this one this is by far my favorite episode so far. Love the story, love the characters, but ultimately I love the action and the editing and the score, the soundtrack. Uh, I did watch this episode wearing headphones with surround sound headphones and it, it, you could hear like a pin drop, you could hear the footsteps and I really liked the audio, uh, the uh, sound engineering for this episode. I thought it was done very, very well. And so with that being said, folks, that's my review for episode 6. Let me know in the comment section below if you've seen this episode and if you liked it, tell me why or why not. If you liked this video, click that subscribe button uh, if you want and all that good stuff. And until the next one, take care.